mentioned. But I've, I've also got Kwasi also um, yeah, in the list, but you asked for one name, so I'd leave it as as one of the two that I mentioned. In this interview, Kwasi Asumano is talking about one, how he learned different languages and cultures at an early age and how that allows him to integrate quickly into new environments still today. Two, how his earlier job in QA gave him a lot of empathy for users that is still useful for him in his role as a coach. And three, the elastic band effect. I'm Yves Hanul from Who's Agile. My pronouns are he and him. Welcome to my channel. You see a lot of Agilists around me on this screen. If you want to hear me interviewing, please click that subscribe button because these are the people that I've invited so far. If you think I'm missing people, let me know in the comments. And that like button, well, if you liked today's interview, don't forget to click it. Hello, welcome, Kwasi Awusu Asumani. Good morning. I assume it's still morning around at you. Well, it's it's kind of in the, the afternoon kind of morning, something like that, right? It is, yeah. It's just seven minutes past midday. So we, we're just on the cusp of afternoon. Yeah, so so uh, just for, for everybody else, I'm uh, Eve recording from Belgium and Kwasi is in London, if I'm correct. That's it, yeah. Um, yes, but we stay with London. Yeah, for, for the people all around the world, that's probably <laughs> close enough to, to, to state it like that. Indeed. So, Kwasi, um, well, introduce yourself. Let, let's start with that. Who yeah. are you? Yeah, thanks, Eve. Um, so my name is Kwasi, uh, as Eve said. Um, I am founder of Oak Agility Limited, um, based in the UK, London. Um, I'm actually living in Oxford, but London is commonly most known for, for many, um, so I tend to stick with that um, and I've been working um, as an independent organization company for, for I think well the best part of six seven years coming up to that um, wow. and predominantly working with ma many organizations on the path to agility but our, our services have diversified way more than just agility uh, and is on other things that maybe some of those might come up and it would show based on the, uh, the questions that you ask me what what I do what I focus on and what, who I'm about um, in that sense but yeah delighted to be with you Eve. thank you for asking me to join you uh, I'm super excited for this well I'm excited as well it's it's always nice to meet new people because for the people here uh We've actually only met over the internet in, in a few mails and and and, uh, and and yeah social media kind of thing, but really we haven't met in real life. Um, and this is for me with with Who's Agile. I like to actually uh, well reconnect with old friends and and make new friends. So uh, everybody will discover what I will discover today as well. So that's that's also a nice one. And I want to jump immediately into that uh, first question: that what is something people usually don't know about you, but has influenced you in in, in who you are? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, uh, no, well, I'll tell a story, a brief story about this, because yes. uh, that, that is pertinent to uh, what it has influenced who I am to now. So I was born and raised in Ghana, West Africa. Mm -hmm. I lived there till I was about 15. Uh, and in that time, as I was living, my, my dad was uh, abroad, so he was living and working in Italy. So when I was 15, I left Ghana to join him with my mom and my siblings at the time. Um, uh, that that meant a huge cultural shift, right? I can um, imagine it's just... <laughs> amazing that the gap was just like kind of it kind of you show in the in the camera, but it's huge. Um, that... And did you speak English before that or not, or, or what language yeah, did you know? Yeah, I spoke English. So in Ghana, English is the official spoken language for offices and business and everything else, even in schools. Mm -hmm. But we also have our traditional dialects. Um, and we use that in schools and at home, but the English is is good. We we use that very well. Um, yeah, because when you say official language as a fifteen year old, you're not so much in contact with business, but you you already speak it frequently at that age. Right? Yes, yes, at that age, because yeah. in schools everything was done and taught in English. Um, ah, also that part. Yeah, okay, that's yeah. very interesting. I'm learning again. Okay, thank you very yeah. much for sharing. So, okay, so a brief thing in there. So Ghana was colonized by the British back in the days. Mm -hmm. 
So everything we do, our whole system is English led. Um, schools okay. are taught in English so much so that even the traditional dialects, if you are caught on campus or in school speaking the dialect, traditional dialect rather than English, you get into trouble unless you are in wow. a traditional dialect lesson where you are learning deeper meanings and, and concepts of, of the traditional language. So yeah, it's interesting. So Ghana is an English speaking colonized country. Um, like other French African colonized countries, they also speak French, but Ghana is English. So I spoke so, uh, just just to to wrap, go a little bit into that because yeah. I, I think it's interesting for many people is that it's it's good because you learn a language that you can use abroad, but at the same time you're kind of punished for your own culture in a sense. Yeah, which is which is very sad as, at the same time. I agree. It, it it was it was very sad. It was almost like only at home you can speak traditional dialect because back in the days also our parents were not those that spoke and learned English. So we have this whole divergence of at home, it's the traditional dialect you spoke with your grandma, with your mom, with your dad. And then you go to school and then you get punished for speaking it unless you were in a lesson, which is in that traditional dialect. So it's a very cultural uh, <laughs> challenge in those circumstances. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it uses both parts. Well, it, it, I have always heard that if you have two languages and you learn them very early on in, in, in a very different systems like these are, it's good because it, it wires your brain in a certain way. But yeah, I find the way it's set up is, is also very saddening. Yeah, yeah um, very much, very much. Uh, yeah, I, I think, I think the but, system is probably assessing itself and probably things are changing. But yeah, back when I was there, at least, that was my experience in why I lived and breathed. Yeah. It's, okay, uh, but I'll, I'll I'll jump into your story. So continue with your story. <laughs> that's brilliant. That's really good. Um, so left Ghana when I was fifteen and joined my dad with my students in Italy. We lived in Milan, and that on the subject of languages, that meant I had to learn a new language as well wow. to incorporate into the whole system of Italy and what the culture is and making friends, establishing relationships, building connections and contacts. Um, and imagine a 15 year old prime teenage years of everything that comes with it, trying to integrate into a new country, a new culture, a new, a new everything. Uh, yeah, because 15 year old integration with friends is really important. Mm, yeah. yeah. Otherwise, you feel segregated, you feel, uh, you feel exactly. isolated, a whole lot of things uh, happen. And you, you want to be, you want to belong as a 15 year old, you want to belong to a group, a unit. Um, it's a, and uh, well, for me as a 15 year old, and I see this all around me, is that 15 years old, it's already hard to belong. It's already a struggle. So if you do that in a different country, it's yeah. uh, I, I cannot imagine it. <laughs> yeah. So it, it was it was hard. So I learned I learned the language. I did a, a language school, um, and maybe the age to the point that you made, uh, uh, which is true. So when you're learning a new language at an early age, it helps wire your brain quicker and mm -hmm. you get to speak it quicker. Also being in that environment, everything spoken was Italian, TV was Italian, friends, if you go to the shop, everything was Italian. So I was kind of immersed in it and I had to, although I was learning it, I had to speak it very quickly and very badly, mm -hmm. very quickly, if that makes sense. So that meant I learned the language very quick and I was able to start Italian school. So in all of that, the highlight is that shift from different culture, very, very different African culture to westernized culture, learning a new language, learning to integrate, learning to be um, uh, aware of my environment, the people I'm around with, respectful of their culture. Um, sort of developed this innate sense of appreciation in me in terms of cultures um, mm. and bringing it all the way through my life and through where I am today helps me really appreciate from that initial stance, really bond and connect with different cultures and appreciate who they are, what their background is. Because I had my own background in my cultures in, in Ghana and Africa. Um, and I, I love it when it's respected because I give the same back to different cultures when I when is that so that, that translates quite well for me I think that also shows through um, in terms of how it's influenced how I operate with my connections my relationships my clients my the, the, the work I do um, because I hear people say oh you're so great with people um, and it's it's 
I believe that is one of those shifts in that early age I had that helped influence that behaviors and that sort of um, what I go to when I start to engage new people, new cultures, new new um, connections. Right. Um, so that's that's a brief story for that one. We'll, I think we'll touch on that again in, in a sense. But that's one thing that some people don't know. When I say I speak Italian, um, although I'm, I'm a little bit saddened because I'm starting to lose it a bit, which which is which is not great. But I need to speak more of it. Um, but when I say I tell people I speak Italian, they go, "Oh wow, okay, didn't know that." Uh, <laughs> Do, do, you, do you still have relatives or friends in it, Italy that you have or in contact with? I do have relatives there, uh, but they are African relatives. So when I call them, we speak, <laughs> we speak our native. Uh, but I do have Italian friends that I've kept in touch with for many, 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 many years. Um, and when we do the message, I still speak uh, in Italian. Um, and that innate learning the language at a, at a young age kicks in, um, sadly, my vocabulary hasn't increased, so I'm still using the vocabulary that I developed. Oh, 15 year old. <laughs> yeah. So I speak like a child when I'm talking to my friends in Italy. Yeah. <laughs> <about>. yeah. <laughs> I, I kind of get it, but but I I really like the way you link it because indeed as an as an agile coach or when you as an agilist you join a company, um, showing respect for their culture is is a big part of because part of what we do is changing the culture, but it doesn't work if you just bump in as a bully and throw away their culture. That's a little bit what you're saying. You you understand the the importance of culture, so you respect it and. Probably you're because of that you're much more effective because you you care about that culture. Yeah. So that that is indeed a very it's a great story. I, I really like it. Yeah. It uh, it will yeah it will make me think even different about culture when I go into country in, into companies and, and people like that. So thank you for sharing this. This is a great story. I want to go to the the second question. If that um, if you had not been IT, and I don't know how technical you are, but uh, if you had not been to IT, do you have any idea what would have become of you? Were there other paths on on your route that you didn't yeah. take? <laughs> yeah, that, this is an interesting question. Um, so my my technical skills gets to a point where um, uh, okay. Quick brief story again. So when I graduated, I landed into my first graduate role, uh, and I was a QA engineer. Um, mm -hmm. And in that time, it was a manual manual QA engineer. But progressively, I started moving into sort of the automated automation sort of uh, side of things. So I learned a few languages, a few scripting, and and, and a few ways of of going. And also having worked in a lot of the um, implementations back then and even now as well. So my IT background is not that deep uh, and extensive. It's more broad in that sense. Um, but this is a very good question and I, 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 I ponder on it. Um, and despite the many aspirations of the dreaming of being a sports person or a sportsman or whatever it is in various different sports, I did play a lot of sports when I was young. But that's that's not where I don't think I would have. I don't think I would have ended up there. Again, I would kind of connect back to the African culture because growing up or in the African culture back in the days, I know things change and things move on. Culturally, um, when when you're born, your parents would love you to be either a doctor, a, a, an architect, a lawyer uh, of some sort, right? So those are the dream jobs. Anything else? was not quite seen as a job. It was seen as you're just not doing anything. Um, you're not part of the big uh, <laughs> job. But yeah. I wonder how, how th this might be really interesting to hear in the comments, because I, I'm told I have to t tell people to go back to the comments okay. uh, in, 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 in YouTube. So that's interesting, because I have the feeling in, in my uh, day, it was similar. So in Belgium also, again, doctors, lawyers, architects, mm. these were the three jobs to, to have, maybe bankers as well. That's, that's another one. Mm. Um, but so it, it feels a lot similar. Uh, so I don't know how, how related that is to African culture or Belgian culture. Maybe we're just uh, our families. I don't know. So I would be really interesting to hear if people watching this video have uh, similar kind of things. But I jump in. Let's go back to yeah, your story. It's, it's brilliant. I would, I'll, be watch, I'll be keeping an eye on the comments for this as well. I'll be really, really interested. Um, so 
yeah, I, I, apart from I don't think I would have ended up as a sports person in any way, shape, or form, even though I played, like I said, I played a lot of sports back in the day. But more and more as I was um, developing myself, <laughs> uh, as finding my feet, finding what I wanted to do in life through education and studies and what I liked and what I, what I didn't like, um, I think I would have ended up doing something with people. I don't know what it would have been um, mm -hmm. at all, but that sense of connection, sense of building relationships very quickly um, when, I, when, when I'm in, in the space, um, in the new environment, even my wife to, today, uh, she she keeps telling me <laughs> you you are the you are a socialite you are the <laughs> the one that like when when we were in a space a new space or a new new place I I I'm able to really integrate like really quickly and I I think again oh. part of that experience I had in that young age, integrating like, in Italy integrating in somewhere else absolutely exactly. absolutely so yeah. I can really in integrate into a new environment very quickly by really just connecting with people and say hey like really without holding back being curious but asking questions how, how are you like generally trying to integrate and, and belong and be in there um and i think that aspect of me would have been always where i would have done something with with with, with that side i don't know whether it would have been uh, counseling, maybe, maybe the path of coaching that I am in now, even more so beyond agility side of things, because uh, we, we, we'll talk about that as well later. Um, that path would have always come in, but I don't know exactly what it would have been. I, I don't want to do, start, do the cliche thing of yeah. maybe being a footballer or being a, a, a runner or being a table tennis. I used to play a lot of table tennis, actually. Oh, I did too. Great. Great. <laughs> nice. We have another thing in common. That's, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, uh, I think certainly something uh, with, with people in the sense of, yeah, who they are, helping them on a journey or even yeah i, I don't know what we yeah, did but yeah it, it's a hard question for many people and many people tell me like if how, how would i know what i ended up with <laughs> and some some have very uh clear answers like yeah. uh, the the interview i just did with shane he had a had an, an idea what he would and, and did it still for a long time as a hobby but for many other people it's um it, it is a hard question to do um i'm actually also interested to hear that you are in as a qa because one of the diversity problems i have with uh with who's agile is that I, I in the beginning when i started out i was only looking at coaches and developers and, and i realized wait a minute qa people are a very important part of, of, of agility for me as well mm -hmm. so i wanted to make sure that i invited enough uh, people who were in interested in testing or have a background in it so mm. so it's good to hear that you have that as well because it's then then there, there is at least a few more of these people that i didn't yeah. realize that were invited yeah and, have, and uh, sorry if i may i'll just quickly touch on that aspect as well i, I think something that on reflection as well because i do a bit of I do quite a lot of reflection um my background as a qa working in that space and in that stance all the time taught me a lot of empathy and being able to really step into the shoes of those that will be actually using the product that's been built. Taught exactly. me a lot of empathy. Uh, and I think that translated also through my coaching trainings and everything else to, to, to where I am. Because as a, as a QA, you are really trying to use the system in, in the totality, in earnest of the user, the customer. Um, you cannot be biased to your developers, your best friends that you have coffee with and say, oh, yeah, yeah, let's, let, let this one pass. Um, you are really vying for you, you need to think of, yeah exactly and it's a, it's a different kind of way of trying i've yeah. i've started my career as a software supporter so i was picking up the phone for people that were using software and so i didn't have the testing background at that time but i've learned a lot about how bad some of our systems were because i had to help the people that were not able to use it so uh so i i get that and that empathy helps me a lot as a as a coach as well to 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 really talk to developers so that's that's that is indeed a very important skill to have um 
So I want to go to that third question. What is for you your biggest challenge, or at least the biggest challenge you want to share? Because sometimes in after talks, I hear people, well, I didn't share the biggest challenge because that was not something I wanted to have on camera. But mm. what is the biggest one that you want to share? And, and why is it a good thing for you? Yeah, that's, that's, that's yeah, again, another wonderful, wonderful question. You have amazing questions. And, and if I may, in my case, then I would like to reframe that question from a challenge Go ahead. opportunity. Uh, so what is the biggest opportunity uh, for mm -hmm. me uh, and, and or for, yeah, for what I'm trying to achieve in my goals, my vision, um, and, and more of what I do, um, and I think it, it comes, hopefully, so far, at least it's coming through, um, is that human aspect um, of everything we do. So what do I mean by that? Everything I do with my clients, my teams, um, is really bringing the human side to things. So humanizing, well, human-centered approach, basically. Uh, and that's something that we do a lot. And that's what I do a lot. And that's what I, I, I focus in on. Because get that right, you solve everything else. Um, mm. Get that human-centeredness and the human presence and the human totality within your team, within your organization, you get everything because it is us, this human generation, we've solved so many different challenges up until now in the world. What makes us think that we have to put all these kind of barriers and containers around restrictions around ourselves to try and do something different, right? Liberate that, bring back the humanity side of things that we can think bigger, we can think broader, we can think freer, and we can accommodate all of who we are, bring all of ourselves, because that's going to... That's an important part, huh? Bring, bring our whole self in, into, the, into the picture. Uh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I have a friend, uh, one of the first Belgium agilists, uh, Pascal van Kouwenberg, who used to say, um, making software is easy. You make a good team and they do the rest. And, and that's a little bit like what I hear in your story. Uh, you, you try to bring in, and of course that first part is hard, so it's not easy. <laughs> but if, you, if we can do that, they will, they will do the, the rest of it. Um, yeah. And, and yeah. That's, 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 that's so wonderful. Thing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, and so that's why I wanted to reframe your question mm -hmm. from challenge to opportunity, because I think one of the things that the pandemic taught us, and it awoke, a lot of organizations the fact that they need to take care of more and more of their people um, and as things open up again some of those behaviors like the elastic band effect is starting to go back and trying to contain and trying to restrict and trying to force people to do things that they are they're not <laughs> wait you you think about you talk about elastic band uh, effect will you say, say some more about that because i'm not sure i grasp it fully yeah i, I will i will do um so it's essentially the the behaviors, I'll use this example. So in organizations pre-pandemic, there is all these kind of restrictions, all these kind of things. Or if someone wants to work from home because they have to take their kid to an appointment, they're like, we have to monitor that this person is green on MS Teams or, or Yammer or whatever it is that is being used. And they're doing their work and they're working and they're working the hours they need to work, right? Post-pandemic days, people were working around their lives themselves and they were, they were delivering, they were actually, Statistics. In many companies, we, we deliver more. Absolutely. There were, there were overproductivity was going on and uh, lots of things were going on. So it is possible. So the elastic band effect I was talking about is companies having relaxed and appreciated the fact that they can, their people can be trusted. They're doing the work that they're doing. They're still having lives, but they're finishing off the thing that they needed to finish off because they had to go and feed up their kid at five o'clock for after school but they're back on it doing another 30 minutes things just to wrap up and to finish off their work because they're honest, they're, they're true to themselves. Exactly. Their work. That post-pandemic feeling of restrictions coming back, and that's what I mean by the, by the elastic band effect, companies are starting to put those restrictions back in. You all have to come back to the office. You all have to do this. You all have to do that. We have to start monitoring you again. That's going back to the pre-pandemic days, and that's that elastic band effect. Uh, reference. Um, I think the reframing of the question of the opportunity I see here of continuously humanizing 
our world of work mm -hmm. and also just beyond that, not just the world of work, having tools and techniques and approaches and really finding ourselves and as leaders as well, knowing what it takes to really create a human-centered organization or human-centric teams uh, is powerful. And that's mm -hmm. what, as your, your reference to your, your colleague in Belgium says, you, if you're able to tackle that solution or that's that concoction of alchemy of the people being themselves, true selves, bringing everything to work and give them the problems, they will just nail it just like that. Um, and that's yeah, it's, I, I, like, I like that very much. Um, so, so you actually by by reframing it, you brought the two parts of the question in, into one in a sense. Yeah? Um, so that's that that is not, and, and you're completely right about the uh, elastic band effect. That's what I see in Belgium happening a lot. Mm -hmm. We want to go back, and to make it worse, like what you said, we delivered more while we were from home, and now we have to go back to the office and uh, uh, deliver at the same level as before because we were able to do that. Yeah, but we were able to do that because we're working from home and we were able to work around the, the rest of it. And now we need to lose an hour or two hours a day in traffic again, uh, being a lot less flexible. Um, so yeah, it's it's you're you're completely right. That is that is indeed uh, what's happening. Okay, I want to go to the next question. Uh, it feels again that I don't know you, but it feels that you're a different person because the way you're talking. So so what is it that drives you? Do you do you have any idea on that? Yeah. Um... I think there are, there are a few there are a few things, uh, and I think on reflecting on on this question, um, I wanted to share one that might get people to think maybe uh, because perhaps I'm a weird person, but there is no such thing as weird. It's just difference no. and, and and beautiful exactly. ways of thinking. Um, <clears throat> so there are many things that are success, um, family values, but yeah, they, all the dreaming aspects of it. But I think fundamentally, reflecting and going deeper and deeper, I think I love the concept or the idea of potentially what lies be, be, beyond the unknown. And I will explain what does that mean. So as an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. as, a, as a business owner, uh, I try to do many things in terms of, well, without breaking my weight limit, obviously, <laughs> working process. Hey. Um, but I try to um, do quite a lot of things. I have many things that I try to start as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Because if you're an entrepreneur, you have to experiment so many different things to see which one is yes. for rates, which one is successful. That excitement of the unknown at the end of a certain experiment drives me quite a bit. Okay. Um, so it and it's the the um, the. Is it the experience or is it the, the end fact that you then know if it's working or not? What is there a difference for you? And, and if so, which one? I think that the, 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 the dial will probably shift to the experience piece. Um, and mm -hmm. so if, if I'm by dial, like 60%, 40% will be the experience of going through the experiment. And then 40% will be the end, the, the end of it was the XSX. What did I learn? What, what what am I taking away from here? Um, is is will be the balance. But I think that aspect uh, I'm becoming more and more. I have become more and more aware of it because I started so many different experiments during during the pandemic, even before the pandemic, uh, and even now I'm looking at many different things that I'm experimenting with. And I think that's one of the <laughs> one of the things that sometimes I speak to my peers and my colleagues, my part, my friends and partners. And they go, wow, you, you are always so busy. We don't know, where do you get the time to do all of this stuff? Um, and and mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know where I get the time to do all this stuff. But I think there's an element of that desire, that drive, and that excitement to find out what is at the end of this thing. Like, so you make the time. I think you know, there is a saying somewhere that you make time for what you care about or something like that. I'm paraphrasing. Um, but yeah, that's, <laughs> I don't know. I, one other thing I do, I always say yes, um, without the, not on the things that I absolutely, I cannot say yes to flying to, to Mars because I, I don't know anything about being an astronaut. So obviously, 
Um, so the things that I'm closest enough to, uh, that I know enough about, or I know a bit about, I will say yes to that. Um, and that's, again, some of the excitement that drives me in terms of getting, getting to where I am and where I want to go and how I also then bring this back into, into the vision of humanizing more organizations in terms of how they approach work and life in general. Yeah, yeah there is, your story is, is really inspiring. It reminds me, well, first of all, it reminds me of a video that I've published with Faiza that says also, I say, well, she doesn't use the same words as you said, saying yes to a lot of things, but it's, she also says it's about priorities and mm -hmm. I prioritize the certain things above others. Uh, and so this is where I get the time. That's that's what she says. Um, the other part, especially the 60-40, what you say, one of the questions I used to ask when, when people go for interviews is that, are you a starter or a finisher? And um, and you need both when you do and when you do something, you need both the people who are starters and, and finishers. Um, and I, it feels that you're you're a starter because you start a lot of things, but at the same time you found some kind of ways to finish that because that's the forty yeah. percent. Uh, and I recognize that I, I start a lot of things and I drop it when I notice that there is no energy or nobody's interested in it. Uh, but thanks to agility, I learned to finish stuff because I, I do it in very small chunks. And that's, for me, uh, is a big part of that. So so thank you for sharing because it's something I recognize in a lot of the people that I'm interviewing is that we have a huge drive to start a lot of things um, and finding out whether it's, I would say, stays a priority. Mm. Because when we start it, it is a priority and then you see see something new and it might be a shiny object like like shane hasty said earlier in the video or it might be that it's that it's a huge important thing it doesn't really matter but the fact that we in agility deliver in small chunks it, it really helps or at least it helps me yeah and yeah. that's but that's what i'm hearing in in what you're doing as well yeah i love that yeah absolutely i i, I love the point you made about whether it stays the priority once you started it yeah absolutely well, you talked about a lot of different things you started, so that brings me almost automatically to the next question. What is your biggest achievement? What are, or maybe something that you're really proud of? Mm, yeah, so this one, uh, so many things, family and all of that, mm -hmm. but this one I'm really proud of. So being a an ICF, so International Coach Federation Professional Certified Coach, this mm -hmm. I really celebrated, like I went, over the top celebration because it was one that I was working on when I discovered that I wanted to go to the path of learning, the path of mm -hmm. craft, um, a path of equipping myself to be able to A, serve myself first um, because you go on a journey, you, you do it for you first and foremost and then you do it for others. Um, when I wanted to go onto that path of coaching craft, and I, I remember doing a few in the beginning in the early days and they were talking about ACC, so Associate Certified Coach. I'm like, oh my goodness, I don't think I'll ever get there. And I swung my eyes to the right and I saw PCC and I'm like, oh, I was going to take forever. It's going to take years. But so proud of myself in terms of the, the, the tenacity, the drive, um, the motivation, and also the people that I surrounded myself with, mentors, um, peers, right? And all the the time, the learning time, and uh, because you, if you're going to get something, you have to invest a lot in. Uh, so I was really And it's a huge proud. investment. Huh? It's oh. a huge investment. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Huge investment. And I was so proud of it when I when it eventually, uh, eventually came in. So I, I was like, wow, this shows recognition of uh, all the work I do uh, with my clients uh, and, and my teams uh, and also using a lot of the learnings on myself and with my family because that's what it's about we have to do it if we're uh, working with teams and we're coaching them on something we have to have evidence that it's and we're lost track of it i'm not sure what's happening i you're back i'm back <laughs> guys you're off. Um, wow. So hopefully, hopefully, uh, it's a short snip. 
Well, you were middle in the talking, and then your your image froze. You were so, you were such in in uh, ah. I, this is really sad because you were so into the story. It was so good. I'm sorry. Uh, no, it's well. <laughs> shit happens. It's uh, um, okay. So I mean, you were talking about yeah. uh, what I, I just said is that um, you um, the what was it that uh, that it's such an a main um, an, a big uh, good thing because it takes a long time to do the ICF. It, so yes, that's it's a huge yes. uh, thing yes, to right. continue from there. That's right. Yeah. So I think I was saying, um, and thank you for bringing me back to where where I was. I think I've, I've got where I was. I was saying it, in order to work with teams on tools and techniques, or even coach teams on anything that we we as GDC coaches or, or or professional coaches, whatever it is. We need to have used it ourselves. We need to have had evidence that it is something that adds value in some shape or form. And whether or not it will add value to the team in, in front of us or with us mm -hmm. is another question. But we cannot do or because we, someone once said to me, the most invasive thing that we could do to one another is ask a question. Because when we ask a question, we we intrude ourselves onto someone to think about what we are asking for them to then answer. Yes, they mm -hmm. have the option to say no, I don't want to answer it. But one of the most mm -hmm. intrusive things is to ask a question. And if if we picture that and we design a facilitation method or approach or container to take a team through getting some outcomes, yes, there are teams. Yes, it's a, a contract that we've agreed to coach them and then be coached by us. But equally important, we have to appreciate that we are doing to them something that we need to have gone through ourselves. And we should know how it feels to go through some of the questions or some of the setup that we are setting up to run something through with them. So it is very, it's a proud thing that I, I did achieve um, my, my PCC. And I really, um, yeah, I really celebrate that. We don't know how. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Um, yeah. Okay, let's. Um, so I want to go to that uh, that next question about personal agility. Do you have any personal agility tips that you want to share with the rest of the world? Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, so it's pretty much similar principle of how I operate with any organizational teams in front of me, and it will come back to that human aspect of it. So the the, the tip is to shift the focus from agility or agile in the first stint. Shift focus completely. Don't even focus around that. Focus on the organic parts of the system. So by the, by, by the human, the heart, the feeling, the hearing, or all of that that is happening, right? So understand, get close to the people, truly see, hear, feel, sense, so the guts as well. Um, everything that that system is screaming out for what does that system need? what does the people what do the people need what is it that the leaders are yearning for what is it that they're not saying that they need but it's showing through behaviors and and, and other things right so shift the focus. and when you talk when you talk about system you talk about team level uh organ department organization all levels or how do you how yeah you so it, dep it depends on uh so for the listeners it depends on where your sphere of influences are you coaching the team or are you coaching the department mm -hmm. as a whole or are you an, an enterprise coach coaching the entirety um, so whatever your context is um, shift the focus first so let's use the team level to start with so at the team level shift that focus if they want to do um, they want to get to agility yes they will express a lot of things on the backlog to work on and improve uh, but before you get there really seek to understand what the people need what is happening what is going on what is the individual voices in that team yelling out for what are they screaming for really um hear it see it feel it sense it and then co-create with them from there um and, and if you elevate that to department if you're coaching the department or elevate it to the whole organization if you're working with other coaches coach of the whole organization fundamentally i think again back to connecting the threads to the earlier conversations, when you are able to solve the people side of things and you bring that human centricity, you can solve the other things. Because agility, um, 
uh, for for me, in terms of how I work with it, any different or many different organizations I've worked with, agility means different things for each team and each organization mm-hmm. I work for. So understanding that means you can work to help them to achieve agility, but understand the the people, understand also help them to see and feel what is going on, so that collectively they can have a better clarity to then create what true agility means for them, because it's an enabler to enable the people side of things to flourish. Uh, but if you don't understand the people side of things more, then the other things might still feel unsatisfied, if that makes sense. I don't know if that makes sense. It, make, it makes a lot of sense. And I like that you, in the beginning of your talk, you, you talked also about seek to understand. And it reminds me immediately of, of Dr. Kobe who said that, that, that uh, important phrase seek to understand before being trying to be understood and it's i feel that this is kind of a core for for agility for many of the agile people and the coaches i i know it's like okay indeed let's let's try to understand what is their problem let's try to solve it and some people call it low-hanging fruit but for me it's like it's caring about the people yeah. like you say we care about the people we try to see what is their biggest problem we help them with that and and then we co-create the yeah. next level and the next level and and that's the thing yeah. because indeed we we can uh we can help them with um, with some of the agile books and agile thing this is what agile says but they don't care about that yeah. agile should this, this is really about helping the people so how can we help the people if we don't listen to them first so thank you for sharing it's um it is I think a core aspect for how many of us work, but um, it's it was it. I think it's also the first time that it came up in these interviews. So it, it shows that we sometimes don't always talk about it. Although I see a lot of us working that way. Mm-hmm. So it's a really good tip to share because people who are new into the agile world, it might take them a while before they realize that that's really at the core. Yeah. So thank you for sharing that. Absolutely. That is. Um, thank you. And I want to go to that. Well, you t- already talked about the pandemic and the fact that we're working remote. So um, is there anything that you've learned, well, recently or, or maybe before mm. about remote working that you want to, to share with us? Yeah. Um, so when the pandemic started and it hit in the early days, it really affected me <laughs> uh, because I was I. it took me some time to really build authentic connections to come through this medium. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, was, I was really feeling it because I, I, most of, some of my energy that I get, um, so when we talk about re-energizing ourselves, taking time to, to, to meditate, if, if, if one meditates, or just reflecting and just getting recharged to then be able to best serve everyone in front of us. Um, some of that energy I, I usually got from being in the same space, in the same room with my teams and with my clients. Mm -hmm. And I missed that a lot. Um, So building authentic connections via this was really tough. Um, And uh, throughout the pandemic, I figured out mechanisms. I upped my meditation practices and techniques to really be present and be able to connect. But I think the one thing that I learned for remote working, even more so, is really building authentic connections with the people that you are with. And also acknowledging and helping those that are on the screen with you uh, to be fully and truly themselves. It's okay if someone doesn't want to have their camera on. We don't know what is going on. If they're willing to share, fine. If they're not, but we should train our ears to hear beyond, oh, I don't want my camera on today oh, I don't want my camera on for this session, they, there might be a tonation in that statement that we can hear something is bigger, is there something more going on? That they might need space, they might need someone to talk to or reach out beyond after the call and say, hey, is everything okay? Right? We should train ourselves beyond just, just the remote piece and have our global listening ears on uh, and, and listen through all mediums that we have. So that connection piece um, for me is everything for remote working establish that build that and you can really have some amazing powerful sessions uh, on your remote calls 
And I link it back to what you said earlier about first seeking to understand if someone doesn't want to turn on the camera. I, I know I have some coaches say, yeah, we should force them and find ways and trick them into learning the camera. And like, no, like you said, let's try to understand why people don't want it. It yeah. could be because they, I don't know, because they're with seven in a house and everybody's using cameras, so they have a lousy internet connection. Yeah. It could be because, well, they don't have a space where they can turn it on with, with other, right. without having other people. It could be because they didn't put on makeup and they don't like to put yeah. it, whatever. It, yeah. it could be so many different kind of things. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, just having respect for that and trying to understand what's happening, it's, it's a huge one. Yeah. Um, I had an interview that that I posted, and I will probably be posted uh, before this one is posted with uh, mm. with Lita, Lisa Atkins. I'll try. I don't know where, but somewhere on the screen, I'll link to it, uh, which has some great tips also about creating connections remotely. Amazing. So she so she um, she has some great ideas on how to do that. Wow. Um, she had a different answer than you, but I think both answers are related. So it's. Um, it's indeed about creating connections and finding ways how to do it. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I like the way, well, you phrase it as well. It's not so much that uh, it's impossible remote, what I see a lot of people saying these days, but it's more that it's, it's harder and it's different and we need to find how to do that. Yeah. And, and pre-pandemic, most of us didn't think it was possible and we had to adapt because basically one day from another we were remote and it was it was not just not an option to not do it so yeah. we had to figure it out and a lot of us learned that actually it is possible but it's a lot of hard work and we need to do it uh, so so yeah it's yeah. thank you for sharing this because it's indeed it is about that connection um yeah and i think it's for me it's about creating a big bandwidth communication and i don't mean it in a technical point of view but if there is a lot of trust between both of us if we work really hard on that then there is a big bandwidth communication where we can share a lot of stuff and it feels the same that if i'm in another country and if i have a good connection with my partner before i leave usually it, it works rather well even if i'm a week in a different country if i leave with a big argument well that week will be shitty for both of us because we won't be able to connect that that's how it is and it's a lot harder to reconnect again remote yeah. uh, and but it it is possible but it's a lot harder work so that is what we need to work on yeah. so thank you for sharing because yeah, no, thank you yeah thank you for sharing yours as well it's absolutely spot on absolutely okay i want to go to uh is there a book that you well i, I always use last but i should actually drop it from 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 the question <laughs> is there a book that you have read that you want to share that you want to talk about yeah um yeah so so one of the books that i i i resonated a lot with um was immunity to change by rob this one huh? yes robert keegan and lisa lisa Leahy. Uh, and I came across this book, actually, when I was doing my um, uh, MBA. And it's, it's a different, it was a different kind of MBA. <laughs> it wasn't mm -hmm. uh, the standard MBA. It's called Inner MBA. Uh, it was mm -hmm. founded by uh, Sa Tammy Simons, of founder of Sounds True, and uh, Soren Godima, who is the founder of Wisdom 2.0, for, for listeners that know. Uh, that we'll put uh, the links in the show notes as well. To yeah, um, and also contributing teachers, uh, meditation experts, uh, and also the likes of Scott Shute, who was the ex uh, com pa compassionate head of compassion um, and, and something for LinkedIn. He's left now. Um, mm. and they, they put together this beautiful program called Inner MBA, and you might guess the inner side of it or this is what's all people focused, people oriented. So the inner side of leadership and how to run organizations from the core, from us, from within. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was beautiful. Uh, and one of the work we had to do before the program started was this book um, uh, with Lisa's sessions around um, change, community to change. And that resonated with me because we work in change. We work a lot with change. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the the takeaway that I had with that is this whole principle of, yes, there is a whole, lot, a whole lot of psychological things that change beliefs, backgrounds, whatever, a lot of things. 
But equally, there is this aspect of, yes, we want change, which is you can imagine yourself with your foot on the gas in the car. So the accelerator, Americans will say gas. So if, mm -hmm. if you resonate with gas, great. If you resonate with accelerator, great. Um, the thing that... Or electricity these days, it's it's more uh, electrical. Electro oh, yes, uh, exactly. <laughs> yeah, actually, let's use that. I'm actually charging my car. <laughs> um, yeah, so if, if you resonate with that, the thing that makes you go fast, um, mm -hmm. So your foot is on that because you want change. You want something to happen, something different, different outcomes. But we tend to also put our foot on the brake at the same time. So then mm -hmm. we're stuck, right? And that's the whole principle of that immunity to change. So we want change, but uh, we really don't want change. So we're stuck. Uh, or we do a bit of change, you know, we, we apply the same amount of pressure on the brake, and then we're back to some stop, some block. It reminds me of when I learned to drive because indeed you want to drive, but at the same time it's like how do you how do I switch between both pedals and then the car breaks down because nothing happens. That's right, exactly. Um, and in there, she she offers of both Rob and Lisa they offer this immunity change or immunity map, uh, and you you kind of navigate from from right to left with big assumptions and a few other things, and you get to a goal, the change goal that you want. And it's so powerful. It's more of a coaching tool, more like uh, rather than just filling out a, 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 almost like a canvas, but it's way beyond that because mm -hmm. you look at your big assumptions. Um, for example, you might say uh, the change that I want to exhibit in, in my own life will be um, how to say no, right? Mm -hmm. You might say I want to be able to say no a bit more <laughs> if, if someone wants that. Um, that would be the goal, but you start with some of the assumptions. So your big hairy assumptions. Why? Why are you? Ne why are you not able to say no? Uh, okay, I'm, ass I'm, uh, I'm assuming if I say no, I'm missing out on some big opportunity. That's one big assumption. Um, I'm assuming if I say no, the person will never ask me again because I will offend them. Big assumption. And then you kind of work your way around those big assumptions and dissect it in a way that actually navigates you to the, the goal that you truly want. And that goal has to be quite clear, quite specific. So you will end up reworking that goal a bit. It might not turn out to be the fact that you want to say no. It might be something else underneath that one. You only um, want to work on the interesting parts. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, was a, it, it was a beautiful book. Uh, and I, I, I can highly recommend it. It's on Audible for, so for those that are more listening, uh, uh, listeners driven as well um yeah it's it, it did a lot for me i like that it's really it's um I, I was intrigued by the name because immunity to change well as a change agent we want people to change so why 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 being immune to change so it's uh but you you sold me on the book uh i didn't know the book before i was intrigued when you you sent the name to me earlier on uh, but now you really sold me onto that. So uh, it will, well, there is a big pile of things that <laughs> I still want to read, as with many of us. Yeah. Uh, but it's definitely something that uh, that I will be interested in. And I would also be interested to learn if other people have, have read it and, and, and liked it as much so far. I want to go to, um, for me, the most interesting question is that what's the question that you think I should also ask you and, and what's the answer? Yeah, and, and this question, th sorry, this question, um, I don't know the answer to it myself. I'm still figuring it out. Um, okay. But the question that I put here, and this is more of a big world order question, systemic question, is mm -hmm. what is the world calling out for me to do? Mm. So, wow, that's indeed a very large question. That's a big question, right? That's, that's big and deep. So um, on all the reflections, we, we, we work with systems and with systemic thinking, bringing it out, systemic coaching. We also have this global aspect of our impact on the world and our impact as we impact individuals, we impact teams, we impact organizations, we impact societies. We fundamentally impact the world as well. And what is the world calling out for me to do? What is the gap or what is the thing that our world wants me to fulfill? 
I, mm-hmm. and I'm listening. I keep listening. I keep doing my part. I keep doing things that I, I fundamentally believe is contributing to what the world is calling out for me to do. Um, and more will emerge, more will evolve. Um, and I think we should all ask ourselves that question every now and then and say, hey, okay, I'm doing these things, um, going through the motions, whatever it might be, but what is it that our world needs me to do? What is it whispering to me to do or to take care of or to fill in what gap? Um, And it's refreshing. It's almost meditative (laughs) um, to kind of think from the small aspect and then think a bit bigger think about the connections, think about the impact, think about the connections, bigger connections, impact. It is quite meditative. So I'm, I'm listening, I keep listening. Um, uh, and uh, hopefully, hopefully the bits that I'm doing is taking to what I'm being asked for by the global universe to kind of do. Yeah, I, I like it and because one of the things that, that I like about my question is that it brings indeed questions that a lot more people are interested in answering. Uh, it only occurred to me right now that actually it might be interesting for people who are listening to the video to answer that also in the comments on in different ways. In, in an earlier version of this project, when it was in a book version, I, I let people select questions from other people who answered it and, and to answer that as well as, as part of it. But in a video series, I, w- I didn't figure out yet how to do that. So that might be the right way to ask people to in the comments th- to answer it, even the with a deep question like that, that might be hard to do. <laughs> so that uh, that might be good. But it's it's really like you say, it's a question. Well, the answer will never be finished. Like you say, it's in ten years you will have a different answer to that than than you have today. Uh, but it's good to keep thinking of it. Um, I like to take yeah, every year during my holidays, think a little bit about that. Where do I want to be in the next five to ten years? What is my life goal or things like that? Different kind of, the, it's not always the exact same question, but it's around that idea. What is the world wanting from me and what could I offer the world? So it's a really deep question. Um, and I noticed that when I ask a question like this to myself, it really helps me focus on my core. Because, of course, part of what we're doing is about making money to survive with the family and whatever. But that's that's just, yeah, That wh- why do I do this? It's not the only reason why I'm working. I, would, I know that I would keep doing these kind of things even if I have enough money because I want to help and, and reach the, the world in a sense. So that's a really good question to ask. <laughs> so uh, that brings us to the exact last question. Um, who do you think I should ask next? Who do you mm. want me to invite? Or who do you want to invite actually? Yeah, um, I, I don't know whether you, you, you have him on your, net, on your list. I haven't actually spoken to him about this. Um, so maybe Mark Summers. Um, you can ask Mark Summers in the Agile world, um, mm-hmm. but in non-Agile world, I know the talk is who is Agile. I would love it if you were able to get Scott Shute from the ex-LinkedIn Head of Compassion to mm-hmm. come and talk to you and your audience about compassion and helping ourselves, our human selves come out a bit more to be able to serve even bigger and broader concept. I know it's not really agile, but there is a lot of human self in agile and agility. Uh, and all of some of the things I've been talking about, I think I would love it if you're able to get one of these speakers. Uh, and it might, it, there is no such thing as a challenge. It's a reframe. It's good, great opportunity. So I will set you an opportunity well, to get Scott. Exactly. <laughs> well, for, for me, uh, I've done this also with the original version of the, of the book version of this is that trying to also ask people who might not officially be part of the agile world but f- that have for me that same spirit and um i don't know how uh how much influence i have to to ask these people and to to, to make sure that they want to answer it um so uh we'll get in touch afterwards to to get the contact details that you have about these different people uh, and and then i'm going to see if they they want to to join for for such a questionnaire it's it's always the same some people that might be in the agile world might be very interested uh and and some others not and it doesn't depend if they're um well known or not there's 
unknown parts of, that are doing really great agile things that say, no, I want to stay unknown and others that jump to it. And there are big agile names who say, no, I don't want to be part. So we, we don't know. It's just about asking them and um, and, and we'll see what, what it happens. So, so thank you for inviting these people. Um, I think it's, um, yeah, it, it's great to, to have a, a broader network. So I'm really happy about that. Um, Thank you for, for this time. Uh, we had some challenges. Uh, some people might notice that uh, the, the um, um, like, yeah, that the, um, the image froze at some times, but the, the sound kept going. So I will see how how um, how much that disturbs on the video, but we'll, we'll notice it. So Kwasi, if uh, people want to get in touch with you, what is the best way to connect to you? Um, you they can reach me on LinkedIn. <laughs> So um, that should be the LinkedIn, uh, page. The LinkedIn link or through my website, uh, because on, um, on my website, that should can, be the website. Correct. You can, you can even initiate to book in a 30 minute conversation or so, uh, through Calendly. So that, that might also be. Useful. And you have a podcast on there. If I, if I yes. remember correctly, yes, yes. But your partner. That's right. So that's from that. the trenches. Yes. So a lot more people can can learn and, and connect and learn from your ideas. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, it was uh, well. It's it, it still is a Sunday, so I'm I'm always amazed that people want to connect and take the time on a Sunday to have a chat with me. So uh, so thank you. Um, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me first off as well. So it's a pleasure to be here with you, and I really appreciate you reaching out. And it was a great conversation. I loved our, our conversation. So I, I really, really appreciate you very much. Eve. Thank you. Thank you for having me as well. Right. OK. Bye. Thank you for watching Who's Agile, where the stories of agilists come to life. I hope you liked today's interview. Subscribe if you're not subscribed and want to get to know other agilists.